Okay, so good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for joining our faculty colloquium. And today we have a, a speaker from the Institute of Optics in Palaiso, which is located just outside to, uh, of Paris. And Chris Westbrook is a world expert on matter wave optics and uh, methods of using matter wave effects in testing the foundations of quantum mechanics. And he will speak today about the uh, quantum atom optics using per correlation measurements. Chris, please, you can start. Okay, thank you very much. I should share my screen here again. That's yes. how this works. Uh, where did it go? Uh, all of a sudden, I cannot find my talk anymore. What's going on? Yes. Does this work now? Can you see my screen? Not yet, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Then I have to escape. Okay. This is how I'll do it. Okay. Here we go. This works now. Okay. Yes. It's yes, good. it is fine. Sorry about my little, little problem there. Play. Here we go. Okay. So thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak to you about uh, what I'm working on. Before I start, I want to say here in France, we're very struck by uh, all the events, events that are happening in, in uh, Ukraine, obviously. And, and I, for one, am, am very impressed with all the people in Poland who are, who are working to, uh, to help people that are suffering right now. So um, I'm thinking very much of them. All right, uh, but um, now to physics. I'm going to talk about stuff I've been working on for quite a while now. Um, so I'm going to go back and do, uh, do a little bit of history. I'm going to start with a story about astronomy. Um, I'm interested in this particular, uh, the, the, um, the work by uh, Robert Hanbury Brown, who was a radio astronomer, who in the 1950s had an idea uh, that you could um, measure the angular size of stars by pointing two telescopes at the same star, separated the telescope separated by a distance d, um, and then by observing the fluctuations in the intensity of the light uh, attracted from each uh, uh, detected by each telescope, um, one would see a correlation between the two uh, detectors. And studying this correlation as a function of this distance d would tell you something about the size of the star. Now, when this was first suggested, um, a lot of people didn't believe it. They were shocked that this could, this could possibly happen. People who are used to thinking of, of um, light as, uh, as photons and as stars as some sort of thermal objects that emitted black body radiation, that is to say 30 thermal photons, uh, found it very difficult to conceive how um, two uh, separated telescopes could, or how, how, the, how the photons that arrived at these telescopes could be correlated in any way. And so this bothered a lot of people. Um, a lot, and there, was, there were controversies and, and there was a lot of discussion. Um, not everybody was, was confused though. I think Henry Brown was one of them who was not confused. Um, and there were many other people. Uh, and it was especially people who uh, did not think about photons. They just thought about class classical statistical optics. And so here is a quick explanation, uh, a quick explanation that, that sh should render the, the, the effect uh, fairly comprehensible uh, without appealing to the quantum theory. We think of the, uh, the star as this source S. If, can you see my, is this, does this work, my, uh, my mouse? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, yes. Okay. Great. So we think of this, uh, uh, the star as a source, which I've labeled S, that has some size. Um, and what you see on the Earth, on this screen I've depicted here, is in fact a speckle pattern, a random pattern of, uh, of intensity, um, who, which has a characteristic size, which is given by, in this formula here, by the angular size of the star. Uh, angular size of the source. Um, uh, of course, when you just look at a star uh, with your naked eye, you don't see such a speckle pattern. You see that it fluctuates from very from between zero and some large value. Um, you don't see it because these 
speckles are, uh, are fluctuating on a time scale comparable to the optical frequency. And so your eye has no hope of, of, of detecting them. However, modern electronics uh, or even electronics from the 1950s uh, is capable of teasing out a little bit of that, uh, of those fluctuations. And uh, the result is that if you have two detectors that are sitting on the same speckle point, um, the two detectors will see uh, this speckle fluctuate, uh, the same speckle spot fluctuate, and thus the fluctuations they see will be correlated. If, on the other hand, the detectors are on different speckle spots, that is to say they're separated by more than this D speckle that I've uh, shown here, then uh, the, the, the intensities will be entirely uncorrelated and uh, as will be the fluctuations. And so that leads to this uh, formula that the, the correlation between the two intensities will be larger if, if the detectors are on the same speckle point. And in fact, if, if the, detection, the fluctuations are thermal or more technically Gaussian, um, there'll be a factor of two between the, um, the average of the product and the product of the averages. On the other hand, when the uh, detectors get too far apart, this two turns into unity. Uh, and that I've um, sort of uh, uh, schematically diagrammed here in this graph of this quantity uh, G2, uh, the second, uh, which we call the second order correlation function, a normalized correlation function, which simply takes this, this correlation product and divides it by the product of the, of the mean intensities. And so what you, see, uh, what, you, what you see in the case of this speckle, in the case of a thermal source, is uh, this G2, which uh, starts at two and then goes down to the value one as the separation delta X between the two detectors is increased. Okay, um, so it's still kind of weird what happens, how, does, how, do, how do photons know that they're supposed to be arriving in a correlated way? Um, and there were a lot of criticisms and well, basically people didn't believe him that this could, this could possibly happen. And that led to the following famous experiment uh, that Henry Brown did with another collaborator named Twiss uh, in which they did a laboratory experiment to illustrate the exact same phenomenon. The star was replaced by a mercury lamp. The telescope was replaced by just a lens and the photodetectors were photomultiplier tubes that were separated by this, by this um, uh, beam splitter, uh, which was simply there to allow one to uh, superpose one detector with the image of the other. And so you could uh, study very small separations. And then they have this uh, electronic circuit, which basically takes the product of the two photocurrents. And um, here is a plot of their data showing the, uh, the correlation as a function of the separation, the spatial separation of the photocathodes, uh, this time on a, on a scale of millimeters. Uh, and they showed very clearly that, um, that, there, that, that the correlation existed and they were able to understand uh, quantitatively the, size, the, the width of this correlation as well. And I just want to read to you um, one sentence from the, from the, uh, from the um, paper, which was intended to answer some of their critics in the, um, uh, when they made this proposal. Uh, the experiment shows beyond question that the photons in the two coherent beams of light are correlated and that this correlation is preserved in the process of photoelectric electric emission. That was clearly one of the, I haven't, read all the objections that people made to this, um, uh, their, the Henry Brown proposal, but one of them uh, was apparently that somehow uh, photo detection must erase any correlations if they would exist. Um, okay, so this silenced enough of their critics um, that um, people started believing that the experiment could work. And so Henry Brown got funding from the Australian government not from the British, he was British. He didn't get funding from Britain. He got it from Australia to build this observatory um, in which he had these two telescopes that were on, uh, on a circular track uh, with a diameter of almost hundred meters. And so he could study separations up to 200 meters of these two, of the photocurrents in these two detectors. 
Um, and during his uh, during a, a period of about 10 years, I think, he was able to measure the diameters of 32 hitherto unmeasured stars. Um, so in spite of its success, I get the impression that it didn't have a huge impact on the field of astronomy, um, in part because during the 60s and 70s, astronomers were also developing other kinds of other techniques, notably adaptive optics and interferometric, interferometric measurements to measure uh, uh, angular sizes, very small angular sizes. And um, this technique wasn't really able to compete with them uh, because it was only able to measure very bright stars. However, um, the experiment did have an enormous impact on the field of quantum optics. And a number of people, uh, because the question was, well, how would real, one would really like to have a, a clear, uh, cogent explanation of uh, how to understand this effect, this the Henry Brown twist effect, in when when one uh, is using photons. So a number of people, whose some of whose names I've, a number of famous people who, whose names I've written up here, uh, had many interesting things to say about that. And then, of course, in 1961, the development of the laser added added questions to the whole problem because the obvious question was, well, if what would happen if you put a, replaced the source, the lamp in the Henbury bound twist experiment with a laser. And that uh, obviously triggered a lot, of, a lot of interest, some controversies, and uh, it was all very interesting. And most of it was cleared up um, in the early 60s by Roy Glauber, well, among others, but Roy Glauber got the Nobel Prize for straightening things out by uh, essentially doing a very careful uh, analysis of what happens when you take a quantized electric electromagnetic field. So you talk, talk in terms of creation and annihilation operators um, and uh, analyzed what happens when you try to measure, uh, make joint detections, correlated detections of photons. And she shows that um, this correlation, I've now uh, written it in terms of different times rather than different, uh, different positions, but that doesn't make a, doesn't have a big impact. Um, so this, this correlation between the intensity at two different times can be written as the product of these four electric field operators, each containing annihilation and creation operators. And uh, uh, he showed that for a, for a thermal source, um, this, uh, this expectation value amounts to uh, measuring the, thermal, uh, the expectation value of four uh, creation and a set of four creation and annihilation operators with each, each one labeling a different mode in the problem. And he showed that uh, this, this correlator here uh, actually is, is equal to the product of the two intensities. Um, and uh, when the two detectors are close together, there's actually a factor of two that you see here uh, show up um, exactly as in the classical analysis. And I've, I've hidden some of the math here, but um, uh, what happens is one of these terms uh, begins to vanish as the, the two detectors are separated. And so and a very clear, uh, clear logical explanation of how this worked. And it had additional uh, interest because it was possible to also analyze what happens in the case of a laser. In the case of a laser, uh, there's only one mode, a single mode laser will only have one mode. So all this sum here doesn't take place and there's only one term. And so the correlation is entirely flat. Another thing that's maybe wasn't mentioned at the time in his early papers, but later, later was mentioned by various people is that you can also think about how this works for fermions. Uh, and in the case of fermions, the analysis goes, proceeds in a very, in a very similar way, except that this plus sign uh, turns into a minus sign, meaning that at zero separation, the, um, the correlation vanishes, which you can also think of as an illustration of the Pauli principle. So that's uh, a quick introduction to, uh, to the Henry Brown Twistic experiment. And what this did was it got a lot of people especially people like Mandel and Sudarshan to, to think carefully about um, quantum optics. What can you do 
what, what, what are the interesting new phenomena that you can, that you can observe uh, when you have uh, quantized electromagnetic fields and you think about detecting not just one, but several photons in coincidence. So that brings me to cold atoms and uh, my own field. So um, it's been a long time that I've been interested in trying to do this with cold atoms. And the first thing uh, I might have, uh, might, I'd like to answer is, uh, why do you want to do this with atoms apart from it being just a cool thing? Um, an interesting thing we can do with, with atoms is we don't just do it with bosons, we can do it with fermions. Um, and we can do it with Bose condensates. And that means that we have other, uh, other things we can test. Fermions had never been tested. This idea of Henry Brown twist had never been tested with fermions. So we were interested in, in seeing if we could do that. And then there's a, sudden, uh, there's a second part. Um, and okay, the, the first part of my talk is essentially going to be about uh, an atomic uh, analog of this Henbury Brown twist experiment. And I'm going to show you, I'll show how it's done with bosons, fermions, and Bose condensates. And in the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk another about another feature that you have when, you, when you're doing it with atoms. Um, you have atom-atom uh, -atom interactions. So there's a, there's a, at, at very low energy to a good approximation, it just behaves, the atom interaction acts like a contact interaction. And so uh, lots of other things happen that don't necessarily happen with photons. Uh, that introduces nonlinearities, which actually, well, I should say they do happen with photons, but if with photons, they only happen in nonlinear crystals. Whereas in the case of atoms, they happen all by themselves. So the second part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about things of, of, of correlation measurements you can do, which exploit the fact that the atoms interact with each other. So, um, uh, how to do such an experiment. First of all, you, 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 you build this um, horribly complex apparatus. There's a whole bunch of wire uh, electronics and optics and all sorts of stuff. Um, this is a Zeeman, you see in the front of this tube is a Zeeman slower for metastable helium atoms. It's three meters long because hel helium atoms uh, uh, are light and move fast. And so it takes a long, uh, large distance to slow them down. Uh, and the most important thing in the lab are these three graduate students. Those are former graduate students now who are the most important people to get this all working. And so I want to acknowledge um, many of the, my many uh, previous uh, collaborators. Um, on the left, you see the current group that's working in the lab uh, and my permanent, uh, my, my permanent colleagues as well as the past students uh, that have been working on this, um, students and postdocs, uh, many of whom have been really working very hard and made a lot of important contributions to all this work. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about how you do such an experiment. Um, and uh, I'm gonna strip away all that electronics and all that complicated stuff and uh, uh, focus on the most important bits. Um, one important bit, is that we're using metastable helium, which means uh, helium in the two triplet S1 state, that's 20 electron volts above the ground state. So all this internal energy uh, is used to, um, to detect the atoms using a microchannel plate, which amounts to a, an electronic detection, much like uh, a, photo electron, a photomultiplier, which um, takes the, DX, DX, the energy from the de-excitation, turns it into an electron shower, and allows us to detect atoms one by one with very good time resolution and very good uh, spatial resolution. So we can um, measure individual atoms and record their uh, lateral positions and their arrival times. Um, so we do this for a cold, and I'll, here's a little, here's a little simulation. What we do is we, we trap the atoms in, in this. This is a magnetic, this is supposed to represent a magnetic trap in which we've got an, uh, a cloud of atoms that is very cold. It could be a bosine sun condensate, or it could be uh, a thermal gas above the condensation threshold. And once we've, we've gotten that cold, uh, we turn off the trap. And then what happens is the atoms fall down. They're actually fall down under the uh, effect of gravity um, and cross this detector. The, the simulation there didn't show that they were accelerating. They're of course accelerating in the, uh, in the, 
in the Earth's gravitational field. And then when they pass this detector, that's when we, we can, the detector is able to record um, X, Y, and the arrival time. Uh, okay, so that's how the, all the data I'm gonna show you now uh, is going to, uh, comes from such a detector in which we've measured the, uh, the positions of all the particles. And so what we can do is, uh, the, easy, the most obvious thing to do is just measure the number of particles as a function of their arrival time, which amounts to measuring the number of particles as a function of their initial momentum, because the source is negligibly small so that the position or the arrival time that we detect at the detector amounts to measuring the momentum or the velocity the atoms had when they were when the trap was released. So there is an approximately Gaussian distribution of, uh, of arrival times, uh, which corresponds to some temperature of the atoms when they were when they were made to fall. But then, since you have all the particles, uh, you have you've now recorded. Um, the momentum of every single particle in three dimensions, you can do more, you can, you can make the correlation function. So you can, aver you can average this many times and uh, take the statistical average of the number of particles at two different momenta, P and P prime, which turns out to depend only on their difference. Um, and so this amounts to measuring the number of pairs you have in, in a given volume. And what you see is a broad feature which is simply the auto convolution of this Gaussian. Um, but you also see up here in the middle, this a little extra feature, which is the uh, excess correlation due to the fact that the particles are thermal bosons and therefore have a tendency uh, to, uh, the, the tendency of detecting them together is slightly enhanced compared to uh, when they're far apart. And this we can now normalize. And here I'm going to plot uh, normalized cor co correlation functions. So it's the correlation function you saw on the previous slide divided by the mean, the, the mean numbers as a function of momentum. And what you see here on the right is this, it's the same data. And here's this little, little peak above uh, the value one. Um, it only goes up to 1.06 rather than the value two that I talked about earlier because of the detector resolution. The, the resolution of the detector at that time was not good enough in all three directions to actually isolate one single phase space cell. And that's the reason it doesn't go up any higher. Uh, we can also do the same, measure the same correlation in the detector plane. That's this uh, false color image um, where you see that there's a, there's a decided correlation. Uh, the, the correlation in the detector plane is anisotropic because the source, the trap, the, the source itself was anisotropic. It, it was a thermal gas that was trapped in a, in, a, in a harmonic trap, which was anisotropic. So the detector or this method recovers the anisotropy of the trap. Okay, once we were able to do that, uh, we could test a few other things. Um, uh, having done it with thermal bosons, uh, it was easy enough, well, in principle, easy enough to uh, cool the atoms down a little further uh, to make a, a Bose-Einstein condensate. And here we see that sure enough, we got an entirely flat correlation function uh, because once again, to a very good approximation, the BEC was occupying a single mode of the, of the problem. And in that sense, a BEC is very similar to a laser. Uh, the correlation function for a laser is also flat in the same way. Well, a, a, um, a well-stabilized single mode laser is act that way. And then we had a, a, um, a useful collaboration with um, colleagues in Amsterdam uh, in the late Wim Fassens group. And uh, they had uh, done, uh, made not only a thermal gas or a, a BEC of uh, helium-4, but they had also used it to sympathetically cool a gas of metastable helium-3. And so it was possible to, in the same apparatus, to observe the henbury round twist effect, both with bosons and with fermions. And the green and the red data are the data that came from Wim Fassen's lab. Uh, we, brought, we brought our detector over to his lab, and then um, uh, we started, we, we allowed both 
fermions and bosons to fall onto the detector. And there you see that in the case of bosons, the sign of the effect changes because of this minus sign I talked about earlier, or because of the Pauli principle, once again, if you like. Um, right. Um, since then, a lot of progress, this is now, we're talking about uh, 2007, uh, a lot of progress has been made. And I want to uh, just point out uh, a nice experiment that was done, a simil very similar experiment uh, that was done in Canberra by Andrew Truscott's group, um, where they did a very similar thing. They dropped atoms onto a practically uh, the same type of detector, but uh, they were able to arrange things so that they had uh, somewhat better, uh, much better um, spatial resolution. And here in the upper upper left, you see the two particle correlation function um, as a function of distance. Uh, and this time you see it really go up to two and decay down to one. And with also with really good signal to noise. And their signal to noise was so good, they were able to observe not just the two particle correlation function, but the three, four, five, and six particle correlation functions. Um, uh, all, all with, the, with the same data sets. Uh, the six particle correlation function is quite a tour de force but that's, that's basically they're able to, in, in a small phase space cell, they're able to verify or to measure the probability of getting uh, six particles in the same phase space cell. And that is 720 times more likely than uh, the detection, the probability of detection detecting widely separated, six widely separated particles. And indeed this, uh, n particle correlation function at zero distance uh, uh, scales as the factorial of n. In a way, that's that's Wick's theorem for the experts, and the the title of this paper was verification of Wick's theorem. I think uh, so. That was a really nice uh, nice experiment to to illustrate uh, how far you can go, not just with two particle correlations, but with many particle correlations. Um, okay, so that's the end of uh, the Henry Brown twist talk uh, or the, the remarks. Uh, people tell me that when you do, um, well, before I go to the second part uh, of, the, of the talk, um, people often tell me that uh, what one ought to do is give people a chance to ask questions. Um, so uh, actually, if, if anybody has questions about the Henry Brown twist effect, now might be a good time. It gives you a little break to uh, to to take a take a take a breath before I launch into the whole problem of atom matter atom interactions, which is a problem that's a little more complicated than uh, this non-interacting case. Any questions now? If you, have, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Otherwise, we will have that discussion at the end of the talk. Yes. Uh, um, actually, this correlation actually coming from the commutation relation between two fields. Yes. Yes. So when the actually time difference between two detection is large, that correlation uh, disappear, getting to disappear or? Yes. Yes, it, it vanishes at large times and at large separations. Or well, what, what it vanishes when the modes involved are are clearly distinguishable. Right? Um, if you can, if you can tell, it's it's really it, I, I like to think of it as a distinguishability problem. When the problem when the, the atoms are are separated enough, it, it, either in position or momentum or arrival time, so that you can tell where they came from, the the interfer it's an interference effect that correlation disappears. I mean, quite, but it's a, but it's a big star. Actually, yes. one photon actually somehow correlate, correlated to some other photon because yes. uh, it's a quite too difficult to imagine. Actually, it how... certainly is. It's, I I completely agree, and a lot of people had in the fifties had a lot of trouble with that. Because uh, <laughs> even if actually some long term, actually, I mean, so in principle they are related, but but those processes not actually just a single like uh, 
system in the box. It is a kind of huge system and one photon and the other photon is how, how they actually, in the end, actually correlated. Yeah, well, but the, the point is that the star is so far away and that, 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 that Diffra the diffraction limit prevents you from knowing where the photon came from. Right? The, 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 it's necessary. That's that the, that cr criterion lambda over the angular size looks like the diffraction limit for a for a for a small source, and that's not an accident, right? If th that means for a, a detector of that size, it is even in principle not possible to tell where on the star the photon came from. Right, and that, but that's actually what actually also detection is actually they don't detect it at the same time. They detect at a different time. Oh, they could like, be at the same time. I mean, they could be at very, 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 very small time separations. But the bigger the time separation, the less, the more distinguishable these things get, and then the interference disappears, or the correlation disappears. Thank you very much. Me was. If you have a question, please ask. Uh, yes, uh, I have a question regarding this uh, three plots comparing bosons, fermions, and BEC. Okay, this one here. Yeah, so uh, I'm uh, wondering why the uh, effect of the bunching and say anti bunching is uh, rather weak. Uh, once again, that's that's the detector resolution. Okay. Uh, okay. The detector was so it's not, just an uh, experimental. Uh, it's just an experimental or, thing, and and okay. the Australians showed that at least for the bosons, mm -hmm. they can they can make it go up to two because yeah, yeah. Uh, they they worked out the detection a little better. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, Chris. I guess yes. you can continue. Okay, I'll keep going now. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about what happens when you when you allow the atoms or when you take into account the fact that the atoms are interacting. So I'm gonna talk about um, ob observation of atom pairs, which you spent a lot of time on. And then uh, a thing that uh, once we produced atom pairs, we could attempt to do a very interesting experiment, also an interference experiment having to do with indistinguishability called the Honglu Mandel effect um, that I'll spend a little time explaining. And then if time allows, I'll say a little bit about quantum depletion. Uh, in a Bose-Einstein condensate, that's sort of a little more technical, a little more for experts. And if I don't manage to get to it, it's not a it's not a problem. Uh, we can we can I'll talk about it with other people uh, uh, later on if they like. Okay, so collisions um, or interactions for interacting particles. Um, they what what interacting particles do is they collide. So you have things you have two two blue particles, for example, that then bang into each other and give rise to, to, or scatter into other states. Or if you take second quantized language, uh, it corresponds to this is the annihilating a particle in states say one and two and creating two new particles in states three and four. And since we wanna study this in a quantum mechanical way, I'm going to continue doing all this in, in second quantization. Writing a Hamiltonian like that uh, is also very familiar to quantum optics people, because for them, this is the quantized Hamiltonian that uh, describes four wave mixing. So what happens when you have two waves or three waves that interact in some sort of nonlinear li linear medium uh, and give rise to a, a fourth wave, or maybe two can give rise to two others. So when you have a collision like that, and, and so I'm gonna work on, I'm gonna discuss this analogy uh, more in detail. It's, it's a, it's a pretty important guiding principle for us because I'm working at Optics Institute and we know a lot about optics. Okay, so when you have atoms colliding like that, uh, in the center of mass, uh, you have, well, even uh, not in the center of mass, you have energy and momentum conservation. And that means that in the center of mass, uh, for two particles that, uh, that, that collide, like I've shown here, uh, they will have to be, they're constrained to lie in a sphere. Um, uh, on a, or on a spherical shell uh, corresponding to uh, the, the, the space of Ks that can uh, both conserve both energy and momentum. So here is an illustration of exactly that. Uh, this is a cartoon of an experiment in which we took 
two condensates and bang them into each other at some well-defined velocity. And what happened is the, uh, the, the condensates hit each other. Um, the uh, atoms in the condensates had pairwise collisions. They interacted in a pairwise way. And so pairs were scattered onto a uh, sphere, uh, which was determined by uh, whose, whose momentum was the same as, whose radius was the same as, as the initial momentum in the center of mass. And underneath, this is actual data uh, taken under those conditions where I'm showing you a cut through this sphere. And so every, every dot you see here was, is a detected atom. And you see there is a circle here, which corresponds to the spherical shell into which we scattered, uh, these atoms were scattered. And these two bright bits here uh, with lots and lots of atoms that are even saturate the detector are the two condensates, uh, which still contained a large number of unscattered atoms. So that's an experiment that we could do and we could verify that sure enough, we did see a, a spherical shell from the scattering, but there's more than that. Uh, the scattering uh, ought to happen in a correlated way. That is to say for every particle uh, that is created in, in mode three, there's another one in mode, there's a partner in mode four. So, and this mode four should have equal and opposite momentum. So what you see here is a two point, a, a two particle correlation function for particles of opposite momentum. Unlike what we had earlier in Hanbury round twist, they were nearly the same momentum. Here they are deliberately chosen to be opposite. And the presence of this correlation shows that, uh, shows that sure enough, the particles really are, uh, particles with opposite momentum really are correlated. And we can go even a little further and look at uh, given zones in this, uh, on this sphere and ask, well, what is the difference in the number of particles on opposite sides of the sphere? If everything's perfect, you expect that difference to be strictly zero. It's not strictly zero because things are not perfect. One of the things that's not perfect is the quantum efficiency of the detector. Uh, but there are other things that, uh, there are other defects that uh, cause the, the, this, this variance to not be exactly zero, the difference not to be zero. But we can look at the, the variance of this difference as I've shown here, that's this red, this red data. And we do show, we are able to show that the variance of the difference of the number of particles in the two red regions I show here is actually below that of uh, the variance of the difference of particles which are entirely uncorrelated. The blue data was done by, was found by choosing zones that were not diametrically opposed. And so we get data for what the, the, the variance is in that situation. Um, and so I'd like to mention that actually we had a whole lot of uh, input and discussion with uh, various, uh, various researchers in Warsaw, whose names I've shown down here. We had a lot of interesting discussions trying to understand, well, what determines how high this correlation is, how wide it is, how good the, how, how low this variance can get, uh, questions of anisotropy uh, of, the, the, I, showed, I showed the sphere as being entirely anisotropic, isotropic, but it's not quite. There are a lot of interesting effects that happen. And so we had uh, a lot of um, interesting discussions with the people that are noted there, uh, notably Jan, who, um, who uh, collaborated with us on a, on a number of interesting problems. Uh, and I, I encourage you to have a look at some of, some of their papers. A lot of, a lot of really, really hardcore, good theoretical physics uh, uh, problems associated with this, this kind of data. All right, and now I'm going to uh, discuss another kind of collision experiment, um, uh, which we've been using a lot uh, in recent years. It was actually a, a proposal by Hillingzo and Klaus Mulmer, uh, who pointed out that, um, it is possible to put a BEC into an optical lattice and uh, cause it to, um, to create pairs in a spontaneous way. So without having to collide two condensates together, if you put atoms in the lattice in the right way, um, you, can make, you can have it spontaneously generate pairs via a collision. Whoops, oh, well, I'm gonna do this. Um, 
And the way to understand that is uh, you put the BEC uh, in the lattice, but you allow the lattice to move, or you put the lattice somewhere uh, el elsewhere than in the uh, lowest momentum state in the, uh, in the lattice. And what I've plotted here is the dispersion relation of the atoms in the lattice. So this is energy as a function of momentum. A moving lattice corresponds to the in the in the lattice frame corresponds to the uh, BEC being right here at this momentum k zero. That's done, by the way, by um, shining two laser beams at the at the at um, to make a standing wave and giving them slightly different frequencies, so that the standing wave isn't really standing; it's actually moving at some low velocity corresponding to this momentum k zero. Um, so once you've done that, uh, actually, there are two points, uh, two other points on the dispersion relation that satisfy energy and momentum, uh, uh, energy and momentum conservation, or I should say energy and quasi-momentum conservation. And so one spontaneously finds uh, atoms uh, populating these two states and in a correlated way. And then if you adiabatically turn off the lattice, the, the atoms that are here are actually equivalent to the ones that are here. And what you then see when you drop the atoms onto the detector is you see data that looks like this. You see a big blob of condensate at this momentum K0. Uh, and then there are two other momentum states, K1 and K2, here and here, that correspond to the population of these extra states due to the fact that interactions populated these other states, which were allowed because of the dispersion relation uh, in the lattice. So this is, uh, is a nice way to do, uh, to, to create pairs, because instead of spraying the pairs all over uh, a sphere, uh, a spherical shell uh, into four pi, we actually have some select selectivity on the momenta that we, we can choose. We can slightly change this K and K1 and K2, uh, and that gives us a little flexibility in the lab. And a very important thing for us is that um, we can, this process, we can turn it on and off by turning the lattice on and off. So we can make more or fewer pairs uh, simply by changing the duration during which the atoms interact with this lattice. So typical, typical durations are hundreds of microseconds to a few milliseconds to produce a graph like this. Uh, in which we produced hundreds of pairs in these two momentum uh, classes. Uh, okay, so uh, once we were able to do that, we did similar things. We looked at uh, we looked at the correlation functions and we looked at uh, statistical variances, and that behaves uh, pretty much in the same way that I showed you for the the spheres. But now that we have well selected and uh, um, uh, uh, populations in the in in two distinct momentum states, we thought of doing uh, tr trying our hand at the Hongu Mendel effect. So, what is the Hongu Mendel effect? It's a fascinating thing uh, that is about what happens when you when identical particles are input at two different ports of a beam splitter. So, I'm thinking of a particle A and B arriving at this thing, which is a beam splitter, which is which has a 50% chance of either transmitting or reflecting each particle. Uh, and then a priori, you would say that there are four possible things that can happen when this, when, uh, in this situation. Uh, both particles can be transmitted, they can be both reflected, they can both end up in detector C, or they can both end up in detector D, okay? But the Hongu Mandel effect is uh, the phenomenon that these two first possibilities uh, are destructively interfere and therefore do not take place, provided that at the input, we have two truly, truly indistinguishable particles, which are in indistinguishable modes. That is to say, the, the detector C, for example, is there is no way from the point of view of the detector C to tell where the particle came from. And in that case, uh, these two, these two uh, possibilities, uh, they have amplitudes with opposite signs and interfere. And the result is, interfere destructively. And the result is that 
um, in this case, both particles come out of detector C or both come out in detector D. And you never get one in each detector. So this was uh, brilliantly, uh, uh, brilliantly verified by Hongwu and Mandel uh, almost 35 years ago um, with photons. Okay, so here he's uh, doing uh, a nonlinear, uh, there's a nonlinear optical process, um, parametric down conversion, uh, which is producing photons at frequency omega one and omega two, um, which are very close together. Uh, they then meet, they both uh, are injected into different parts of this beam splitter and then are detected by these two detectors. And what uh, one then uh, observes is that the mean number of photons detected in both detectors C and D uh, are not equal to zero. They, when each, each detector detects things, but the correlation between uh, detector C and D vanishes when this beam splitter is in exactly the right position to render the two paths entirely indistinguishable. And that data is shown here. This is the coincidence count rate uh, as a function of the uh, position of this beam sliver BS. Okay. So uh, uh, very striking effect, which is still um, important because uh, many people in the business of, uh, of quantum communication need, uh, uh, need to make single photon sources and not just single photon sources, but sources which make a succession of identical photons, as identical as possible. And this, um, this kind of a setup is heavily used in that field to verify that the photons are indeed indistinguishable. That is to say, have the same polarization, frequency, spatiotemporal mode, et cetera, um, on, successive, on successive shots. So um, this is very famous. And so once we had pairs, we immediately, we immediately started thinking about whether we couldn't do this with atoms. So here is the scheme to do it with atoms. Um, at T1, we have our pair, our pair creation uh, operation take place with this, uh, with this optical lattice. Um, that creates a, a uh, a particle in state A and a particle, a particle at momentum A and a particle at momentum B that separate. Um, they are then subjected to another uh, uh, st laser standing wave, which couples the two momenta, the two possible momenta together. Uh, uh, and what that does is, is it, it redirects the trajectories so that they cross again. And then uh, a little while later, uh, uh, yet another uh, standing wave is applied which uh, acts as a beam splitter, a uh, 50 50 beam splitter, for which each particle has a 50% chance of being transmitted or diffracted. Um, uh, so schematically, that looks like that looks like this. What I've shown up here in in, uh, in picture B, I'm trying to show the vertical position of the pairs of the atoms as a function of time, and I'm trying to uh, illustrate the parabolic trajectory of the atoms. Uh, it's all happening in one axis, in the vertical axis. But if you then try to map it onto the Hongo Mandel experiment, it looks like this, where we have these, the, the, the mirror is now being replaced by a Bragg grating, and then they meet on this beam splitter, which is uh, what happens at this time T3. Uh, we let that all happen, and then we uh, uh, allow the atoms to fall onto the detector. Uh, and then we measure, once again, the correlation between detectors C and D. So here is a two-particle correlation function, this time not normalized, uh, between uh, so the number of particles uh, detected at C and that detected at D. And it's plotted as a function of the delay at which we applied the third, um, the, third the, the second standing wave, uh, the one that acts as a beam splitter. And uh, what you see is if you get it just right so that the, the paths cross in such a way as to be indistinguishable, uh, we do indeed see a dip. Uh, the contrast is bigger than 50%. That's important. Um, and uh, so we, we reproduce something that is uh, pretty much identical to what uh, Hong Uin Mandel did in, in the 1980s. 
it was an arduous experiment because uh, it was necessary to use very few atoms. Um, we only got, we only measured uh, on uh, only on six percent of our shots did we actually get a detected coincidence. And so, in order to get this data, it, each data point represents on the order of ten hours of data acquisition. Uh, so it was a rather heroic experiment, and uh, the students that I showed you in the picture uh, earlier were instrumental in uh, having the patience and the perseverance to take, take uh, the data to get this to work. Um, the contrast is not 100%, as it as, as often is in optics, one is able to get uh, really, really 99.9% .9 contrast. We were not able to do that well, and we think we understand why. It is because uh, in our source, we don't just make a, a pair of particles, we can also make two pairs and multiple pairs. And that causes this correlation to actually, uh, that fills up this dip a little bit. Um, and so we are quantitatively able to understand that pretty well. And so there you have an illustration of this uh, fascinating Hong Wu Mandel effect uh, 30 years after it was done with photons. Okay, so how is my time doing? Uh, maybe I was gonna talk about, about um, I can talk briefly about a quantum depletion However, I have a feeling that perhaps I should uh, I should move to a conclusion. I mean, what's the feeling there? Yes, I, have... I think uh, I, well, it's it is a complicated subject, right? The yeah, complicated... it's 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 more technical than what I've just been talking about. So maybe maybe we'll skip that. Um, and so as a result, all all I say is that quantum depletion corresponds to the production of pairs of atoms as well, and. Um, David Clément in our group has uh, actually recently with his students been able to uh, show that that uh, show these pairs. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, I'm happy to talk about that a little more, but I will uh, instead uh, uh, for the rest of you um, just uh, finish uh, with uh, one slide about uh, future prospects. Uh, one thing we're thinking about a lot right now is um, uh, modifying the Hongu Mandel geometry, which I showed here, which is this black, uh, shows the, 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 these black trajectories, modifying them in such a way as to realize a Bell inequality experiment, because it is possible to choose not just two modes, but actually four modes, which are correlated, and then send them onto different uh, Bragg beam splitters, and then measure, uh, measure uh, four different outputs and their correlations can actually lead to uh, something that is highly analogous to a CHSH uh, Bell inequality. Uh, so we're working on uh, trying to be able to do that. It's even tougher than the Hongu Mandel experiment. You have to do it with very few atoms. You have to control the phases of these, uh, these things extremely well. And what we're aiming for is to be able to do this with large separations. And for us, large means tens of centimeters. To, to, so to be able to, to, to measure a, a bell-like correlation for particles that are separated by as much as 10 or 20 centimeters. We're also thinking about, because this is, this is very tough uh, because you, you have to do it with a very small number of atoms. Too, too many pairs will actually ruin your, uh, ruin your bell inequality. Um, there are also a lot of uh, interesting proposals, not all of which I understand very well, about how, how to do bell tests with more than just two particles. And so uh, we're thinking also about how, you can, how we can modify the, uh, the, the protocol, not the apparatus, but just the experimental protocol to do a bell test with not just two particles, but many. And another direction where we've been going in um, is to look at uh, entang uh, entanglement in other excitations in the BEC. The BEC, uh, actually the, the low, momentum excitations are phonons. And uh, we expect to be able to observe entanglement in these phonons in, as well. In fact, we're not the only ones. There are people, especially, oops, sorry, uh, Jeff Steinhauer uh, in his group has been working on doing a, an analog to the to Hawking radiation and claims to have observed entangled phonons uh, being created by a, an acoustic analog to the Hawking effect. And we think we have some, some things to add to that. And so um, that's another thing we're working on at the moment. So that's the end of my remarks. And uh, with that, I will say that's all. And I'm happy to answer any other questions.
Thank you. So again, please raise your hand if you have a question. So maybe let me, oh, okay, I see someone. Okay, please ask Ti Hun Lee, please ask the question. Uh, you I probably, uh, I missed something when you, you draw the diagram and you, uh, in, only actually two possibility first possibility the photon going in the same here, direction here. but here yes yes well, well well i miss actually why we cannot actually have a, the all right second. well this doesn't really explain it it just tells you what it is however i have another slide which try attempts to explain it a little better okay think second quantization okay and if i have an initial state that has exactly one photon in each of these modes A and B, I can rewrite this state as uh, two creation operators operating in the vacuum, but I can also write it as um, the cr creation operators corresponding to the modes, the output modes of this beam splitter, okay? And that's written in this way. And this minus sign is very important because it guarantees the unitary unitarity of this beam splitter operation. And the minus sign is also really important because it puts a minus sign here uh, at, uh, on this term, which describes um, the amplitude to get one particle in state in mode D and one in mode C, which interferes destructively with this one. Okay, and so the end result that is that a 50-50 beam splitter uh, in which this is the input state, one and one, one particle in modes A and B, it results in this very interesting state, that's to say two particles in mode C plus two particles in mode D. Okay, is that, does, does that explain it? That's, if you're used to second quantization and uh, unitary act action of beam splitters, that's the simplest way I, I have of, of explaining it. But the second equality comes from where? Then this one here. Yeah, yeah. This one comes from rewriting these two operators in terms of those of the outputs. Okay, so there's a unitary matrix which relates A and B to C and D. Right? Uh -huh. and it's like linear optics, but with, uh, with operators, right? Yes, it's linear optics, uh, and, but I've just quantized the field, yes. Okay, thank you. Chris, maybe I will uh, ask the question uh, because the Hongu Mandel effect that you uh, observed is uh, this. Okay, this is a bosonic uh, yes. interference effect. So in principle, I could think about a, a many body so generalization of this effect to, to many body systems, so that you don't have a, one photon, one photon in A B but uh, let's say n photons and n photons. Yes, and they you can. Would also interfere, giving something like this uh, Schrodinger cut state you wrote at uh, the, the bottom line. So yes. n zero, yes. maybe not precisely, but something similar. So the yes. question is, is it doable at all in your setup to, to see, I don't know, a four, four, four atom? Yes, or we've been thinking about that, about whether we could do that. Um, uh, what happens is you, you don't make a, if you put in four atoms, you don't get four, zero, and zero, four. Yes, you also get yes. some two, two. You get, in fact, even numbered states. Yes. Uh, however, you do see, uh, you do get a, a peculiar distribution of, uh, of atom numbers uh, on the extremes, which is clearly different from what you would get if they were, the particles were distinguishable. So we've been thinking about how you could, do, whether you could do that. Um, the experiment isn't working at the moment, but we've we've thought about yes, you you'd like to you'd like to be able to make such a make such a state, and then maybe even uh, turn it into an interferometer in which you 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 create the state, and yes. then you you try to recombine it and recover the old state, which would only happen if all the phases and all the decoherence is under control. And we we've been thinking about how you could do that, and it is certainly an interesting. It would be an interesting thing to try. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. So, if I, I see 
Maciej Pieczarka, please ask your question. Um, yes, thank you. A very interesting talk. And uh, I have a question kind of um, uh, inspired by the, by the very end, as you mentioned that you plan to uh, add some to the topic of this analog gravity uh, yes. experiments. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but is this that um, uh, the Steinhauer group uh, create BECs in a different uh, species, right? It's not in the metastable helium. No, no, it's yes, it's rubidium. Uh, yes, and this is why it's puzzling me. So how it is even possible to, because with metastable helium atoms, as you explained, this is clear to me how to measure correlations between atoms directly, right? But right. is it possible without this, Technique. So, how is it possible that correlations can be extracted somehow with, uh, you know, neutral atoms? Well, it's it's tougher, um, but they're able to do it. Um, uh, and what he's able to do is actually do sort of interference experiments. He does something that's sort of akin to homodyning. I'm not not sure I understand everything about what he does, but he does it in 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 real space. He doesn't do it in momentum space. It's in real space, and that and then he is able to observe pretty much directly or through interference, the density fluctuations due to the presence of phonons. And then by, uh, and then, you know, it, it's an image that was taken by a camera. And then by carefully eliminating noise and, and, and being very, you know, do, doing a really good job uh, with the imaging, one is able to, to, to look at the, the correlations in this image and uh, he claims some, not everybody agrees with him, but um, he claims to observe, uh, observe the entanglement of the phonons that are produced in this analog Hawking effect. Okay, thank you very much because that was completely puzzling me the, because I knew that in the helium atoms it is direct and this is why it's clear, right? So this is why, where I, I guess this is where the advantage is, right? Where yes, yes, it's the, the what we can do is, yeah, we have very low noise, uh, low background detection, and so our correlation is, is when we see a correlation, we're pretty sure what it's what, that it's that it's reliable. However, there's a thing that we that's much harder to do for us, which is to do an interference experiment, doing something that amounts to homodyning. That is to say, having your pairs then interfere with some sort of coherent state, um, which uh, in a geometry uh, in which you, you don't allow the atoms to fall, fly away and in which you can image them, uh, that gives you extra information that, that is not as easily accessible in our type of um, apparatus. Great, thank you very much. Any other questions? If, if, if so, please raise your hand. I can see any, so thank you, Chris. Thank you a lot for this great talk. And uh, thank well, you, everybody. Thank you very much for your attention. And I, I hope you enjoyed it, yes. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. And uh, yes, hear you next time. The next colloquium is in three weeks time on 4th of April. Thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye. <laughs>